You ever had a situation in life that caught you so off guard that it rendered you speechless? Perhaps it momentarily took your breath. I've had two or three of those kind of situations in my years. It took your breath, paralyzed your responses, so that all you could do was groan. You ever heard anybody groan? Certainly not in style, is it? To groan? Do you know the scripture says that groanings are a good thing? When you're in a pickle, through prayer, prayer, there's powerful groanings in the spirit that can take place. If you've never heard of it, I want to introduce you to it. I preached on prayer a few years ago and touched briefly on this topic one morning. But to hear yourself groan. I'm not talking about a manufactured thing. I'm talking about a burden that touches you so deep that you find it in the level of anguish and you find yourself empty with words and you groan. This probably isn't popular in Western culture, but you hear this kind of prayer going on around the world. I will also tell you that when I walked into our, through the years into our retired minister's prayer meetings that Brother Wendell would lead. I remember those prayer meetings and at times I would be passing through or passing in the back and I don't want him uncomfortable. I know he doesn't want attention brought to himself, but I would hear those guys groan in the spirit because they were burdened over things they were praying for. Listen, if you, you need somebody praying for you. I remember when my mother died, I, I, this thought continuously went through my mind. Who's really going to pray for me now? Because I heard her. I knew she prayed. She didn't just talk about prayer. It wasn't just some cliche when somebody walks by and praying for you. I knew she prayed. Who's praying for you? Who are you praying for? What burden do you carry? This message is not designed to make anybody feel guilty. In fact, it's the opposite. It's, it's, I want to equip you with a tool that's available through the power of the Holy Spirit to help get you through your stuff. Sometimes we hit points in leadership. We don't know what to do. We need something to move. We need it to move forward. Somehow you got to take it to the Lord in prayer and believe that he, through his creative design and creative ways, is going to help you move the thing forward. Jesus said, let not your heart be troubled. We're not to be troubled in this day in which we live. If you believe in God, believe also in me. I like this little piece of hope for in my father's house are many mansions. Let's read the scripture together. Romans 8, 26, 27. I'm going to touch on very scriptures, so, but you can keep it there as we kind of unpack a little bit of this. It says, Romans 8, 26 and 27. Likewise, the Spirit also helps in our weaknesses. Now, now just a moment. I want to, I want to, I want to testify here, not, not with words, but with, with an action, just a way of affirming it through an upraise. Has anybody been, been strengthened by the Holy Spirit and you knew it? You knew it. For we do not know what we should pray for as we ought. That's what Brandon told us during pastoral prayer time. We don't know what we ought to pray. But, but here's the deal. The Spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Now he who searches the heart knows what the mind of the Spirit is because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. I would have to rephrase something and say when we heard groaning what we were hearing is the Spirit participating with an individual and praying through them. It's pretty close to a prayer language, isn't it? Groanings of the Spirit. What does one need when we go through unexpected crisis 
that has the potential to paralyze us, our nation, our personal lives, loss. We've had a lot of losses lately. We've done more funerals in the last six, eight weeks than we've done in years. A lot of loss. What do we do? So Lord, make it easy to communicate this in Jesus' name. Everybody said amen. How do we find victory and stability in those devastating moments? Well, a few years ago, we talked about big prayers. I remember that series. Big prayers. Some people would say, well, we need big prayers with words, and there are times that we do. I thought of a big prayer this week when I was preparing for this message in Acts 3. Boy, that was a big prayer. Peter and John are went up together to the temple at the hour of prayer. It was the ninth hour, which basically was six in the morning. And a certain man, lame man from his mother's womb was carried, whom they had laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called beautiful, to ask alms from those who entered the temple. And Peter and John are walking by, and Peter fixes his eyes. He locks his eyes on the paralytic. He says, look at us. I need your attention. Look at us. Then he said, silver and gold, I don't have any money. I hate to disappoint you, but I don't have any money. But what I do have, I give. In the name of Jesus, Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and lifted him up. And immediately the man began to leap and dance and shout unto the Lord. That is an answer to a big prayer talked about this during the series. Sometimes we're afraid to pray big prayers because perhaps we haven't had the responses we were looking for in the past. Somehow it affects our trust and our faith. I would encourage you to keep praying big prayers with words. But is anyone willing to pray prayers without words? Is anyone willing to pray without words, to to groan over a nation that seems to be drifting from the Lord? I'm not talking about political parties and all of that. We get all kinds of imagery in our mind. I'm talking about a nation that seems to be drifting far away from the Lord. Is anyone willing to groan or lament? There's an example of this in Acts 12. Peter delivered from prison while James is beheaded and 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 you know, there's a lot of things that happen. I got questions and texts a couple of weeks ago when people were saying, or last week I should say, when people were saying, it seems like so long ago, it's only been a week ago, when there was an assassination attempt, I got got a couple of texts and and, and they they alluded to this. Why why does God spare um, the candidate Trump and, and and the man behind him dies? Can we really call that a miracle from God? Anybody else struggle with that? Why is a bullet whizzing by just just a short little distance? What was it? A few millimeters? Whizzes by the ear, catches the ear. He's spared and somebody else who's trying to protect his wife and kids dies. How do we answer all of that? I think there's a response to that in Acts 12. You know the story. Peter and James are doing work for the Lord and and, uh, Suddenly persecution rises up in the church and we know the story. There's a prayer meeting going on. Little girl named Rhoda that's there. It's uh, it's one of the mothers of the the men, the disciples, and they're praying. They had called a prayer meeting. They're they're wailing and groaning groaning before the Lord because Peter and James have been put in prison. But you know the story. James is beheaded and killed and Peter spared. What do you do to that? Do you... Pentecostals? How do we find trust in God in that? Peter's spared. We know Peter goes and shows up at the house in Acts 12, and the little girl Rhoda goes in and says, Hey, all of you women, Peter's at the gate. They didn't even want to believe the prayer was answered. They sit there doubting whether or not it was really him, couldn't be him. We're praying for him to be delivered. He's delivered, and they don't believe it. That's the way some of you are. The answer comes right before your eyes, and you still don't believe it. It's exactly what happened here. But we know the story. James is murdered. There's lamenting. No doubt they're lamenting over James. Why, they end up celebrating over Peter. How do we marry all? The only thing we can say is that God is sovereign. God is a sovereign God. 
And God has bigger plans that we don't understand. You say, well, that's a simple answer. Well, no, it's a big, complicated answer. His ways are not our ways, but we see examples of this very thing in Scripture. We know the three Hebrew children pray for deliverance. God didn't deliver them from the fire. He delivered them through the fire. James was delivered into a heavenly place. If you believe there's a heaven, my God, there's a heaven. There's a heaven. Why in the world, in the name of the Lord would we want to be here? But no amens on that. We need big prayers. Big prayers with words, but maybe we also need big prayers without words. There's a book of the Bible dedicated to this. It's called Lamentations. It means to wail, to bemoan, to deplore. Some of you would never go to a prayer meeting where you heard that. It's scary to death. But there's a place for it in Scripture. Praying without words was much more common in the past. You know, I remember hearing it September 11th in the old sanctuary when we called together a prayer meeting because the Twin Towers went down and the nation was under attack. No one knew what was going to happen next. I remember hearing some moaning and groaning before the Lord. And nobody thought a whole lot about it. The invasion of Iraq when I was in Denver, I'll never forget, it was a Wednesday night. People started leaving the classroom because they were hearing or picking up or getting phone calls that we were going in and they ran to the TVs in the church and left class, classrooms. And I remember hearing people praying and groaning, oh God, oh God, help us. Some of their boys in the church were in the fight. Now maybe you don't moan and groan over somebody else's son, but if it's your son, you'll moan and groan. It's learning to carry the burden, carrying, carrying what comes with it. Being in a place where there's a loss of words and something deep down inside says you've got to pray and then you find yourselves not knowing what to pray. But it's in those times the Bible says that the Spirit of the Lord has the ability to somehow come out of those deep places in the heart and body and he begins to well up and he'll use your voice and he'll pray the perfect will of God when you don't even understand it. I, mean, I think we ought to give the Lord praise for that. That's available to all of us when we get in a bad place. I remember it when, the first time I remember a prayer meeting like that when I was a little boy and there was an assassination of JFK, dating myself. I was a little kid, but I remember. I remember my mother and women in the church just weeping and praying, oh God, cover our nation. I remember uh, a couple of family crises, two family crises in particular, when my uncle wasn't supposed to make it and he was in his 40s and got spinal, spinal meningitis. I remember some groaning in the family. We all react differently in those shocking and unexpected moments that bring crisis. Nehemiah sat down in the porch and wept. Habakkuk didn't know what to pray either. He said, when I heard, all I could do is I sat down in my, my belly, my inwards trembled. Job all I could say was the Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away, but whatever happens, blessed be the name of the Lord. John, the revelatory fell on his face. We could go on and on and on. How do we find victory and stability in those devastating moments? First, understand that life can bring us moments when we need, when we need the Lord and one needs unspoken conversation when it really gets serious. One needs unspoken conversation. What do we mean by this? Let's go back to the scripture. Likewise, the spirit also helps us in our what? Do you have any weaknesses? <laughs> we all have breaking points. When we are in our weaknesses, for we do not know what we should pray, what we ought to pray, but the spirit himself, I can't think of anybody else I'd rather have praying through me and for me than the spirit of God. Makes intercession for us. How does he do it? with groanings, which cannot be uttered. Now he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is because he makes intercession for the saints according to whose will? It might not even be according to your will, but according to the will of who? Of God. Pastor, what could possibly cause groaning in prayer like this? I must admit it's I've mentioned a few rare times in my life, but I'll admit it's rare. But what could cause that? 
According to Romans 8, if you read the verses before, these unspoken conversations are the result of suffering. Suffering, unsurety, lack of hope. These kinds of things cause that groaning sensation that comes from the Spirit of God when we don't know what to pray. He said, for I consider that the sufferings of this present time, watch this, are not worthy to be compared with the glory which will be revealed in us. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope. Because the creation, listen to this, creation itself also will be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groans and labors with birth pains. It's as natural as the earth. Not only that, he says, but we also who have the first fruits of the Spirit, then we ourselves groan within ourselves, eagerly waiting for the adoption, the redemption of our body. You know, one reason that I think we have a lack of anticipation for heaven is because we've got it awful good in the United States. I've said this before. We think we're suffering when gas prices double. We, we think we're suffering. <laughs> we think we're suffering when uh, uh, prices really go up. No, I'm not, I'm not for prices going up. Believe me, I'm not justifying all of that. But I'm just saying we really think we're suffering. Have you looked around the world and heard testimonies around the world of people who have been imprisoned for their faith and murdered for their faith? And, 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 and I mean, all kinds of horrible things have happened around the earth. In fact, they still are. They, they, don't, they don't make our media, but we know it. We know it for a fact. We talk to missions groups and mission, missionaries, and we know that kind of stuff continues to happen and is squashed and is kept quiet, but Christians suffer. And I'm not, I'm not criticizing us, but we're probably kind of soft. I mean, when gas prices double, I've almost started groaning at the pump myself. But this comes as a result of some sort of suffering. Suffering isn't something that's real popular to speak about. You don't hear motivational speakers talking about suffering. But it's as biblical as the day is long. Peter gives long passages of scriptures to the topic. Paul gives long passages of scripture to the topic. Suffering is part of the Christian life. In fact, Paul says we rejoice in our sufferings. So let's give the Lord praise for sufferings. Let's hear how big a hand clap that is. Because out of it, he produces godly things. Not that we're all looking for it, not that we all want it. Who wants it? Nobody wants it. But he says there's good that comes out of it. He says, likewise, the Spirit also helps us in our weaknesses in Romans 8, 18. You ought to read that whole chapter sometime. Suffering is a given. Beloved, do not think it strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you as though some strange thing happened to you. Don't feel like, it, oh, it's only happened to America. It's only happening in my part of the world. It's only, he said, don't think it's strange, but rejoice to the extent that you partake of Christ's sufferings. You can identify with Christ and just a little bit of what he went through. Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in this matter. We don't show weaknesses because we're not weak. Because greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. Just because you suffer doesn't mean you're weak. Therefore, let those who suffer according to the will of God, 1 Peter says, commit their souls to him in doing good as a faithful creator. So, agony, anguish, suffering. We've been through a little bit of that. I hate to compare it to what others go through. We didn't know what was going to happen in 2019, 2020. Certain things were knocked off underneath us. Things that we thought we could count on, but you know what? That doesn't compare to the sufferings of my Lord Jesus Christ. When one groans, it can signify a spiritual death, a sense of helplessness, a place one finds where he and the Holy Spirit enter into the suffering by groaning with us, not separate from us. He doesn't groan separate from us. He groans in us and through us. And it's those through the groaning and the lamenting that we re release and control all areas of our life and we trust in his security and his sovereignty. No matter what takes place, I'm putting my trust in you. Not my will, but thy will be done. You pray through me the will of God. 
Then consider the intimate conversation. While we're considering the cause, consider the intimate conversation. Intimate conversations do not always require words. An intimate relationship, all kinds of communication can go on without words. I've seen you young men look at your girlfriends. There's not always words involved. (laughs) Moving right along. I think they got it. (laughs) It can be a gesture, a frown. All kinds of communication goes on without words. A touch, a smile, a spark in the eye. But understand that it's out of intimacy with our Lord that the Spirit interacts and communicates by enabling us in our most vulnerable and difficult moments. It's communicating with the Lord out of intimacy. When words may not be required because the words aren't there when you reach for them. N.T. Wright said, when we learn to lament in the biblical way, then new kinds of solutions emerge as we see our way in different ways. It's through lament that we may even find ourselves asking new and different questions that we may be inclined to ask without, without our suffering. Some questions you never ask unless you suffer. You don't even think about asking. I know I've said it this way for years. We want to pray, oh God, heal so-and-so, heal so-and-so. Um, you don't know the healer until you need healing. You don't, need, you don't know the reconciler until you needed reconciliation. You don't, know, you don't know the Savior until you experience salvation. Am I making any sense? So we may advocate that we know him. We know he heals. You may know he heals, but you don't know him as healer until he heals you. Is that making any sense? That's when we begin to embrace the attributes of God. That comes out of intimacy. comes out of life experiences. You don't know him as deliverer until you need deliverance. You may pray for somebody else's deliverance, but you don't know him as deliverer until you know you need deliverance. That's one of the great things about the 40 years in the desert in the book of Exodus. All through those 40 years in that journey, God was constantly revealing himself as he was right out of the gate when they crossed the Red Sea. They now knew him as deliverer. They didn't know him as healer until they needed him with the bitter waters of Rapha. You could go all the way through those 40 years and God continuously revealed himself to his people. Why? Because he wanted them to know him. He wants you to know him through any suffering. You can come to know him as deliverer. You can come to know him as healer. You can come to know him as a, as a one that answers prayer. You can come to know him as creator. You can come to know him in ways you never knew him. The Spirit is working in you whether you want it or not. He infers that our Christian culture avoids, Norm N.T. Wright infers that our Christian culture avoids lamenting and groaning. He said so much of our modern life, including our modern Western Christian life, is all about instant solutions. That's what we want. And Wright said, I see that that in people who are pastors and Christian leaders and even people who do apologetics, I see it in, in people's theology. You have a lack of faith if you don't get your answer right now. If you have more faith, you'll get exactly what you want. That's not the scripture. That's not what the scripture says. Let's avoid the lamenting by rationalizing that God is sovereign and we people want to do that. Listen, we need to be open to what the spirit is doing inside of us. Can we give him one more praise for the work of the spirit? He works in us. Yes. So how do we find victory and stability in those devastating moments? Secondly, one needs a comforter and a companion. It says, likewise, also the spirit helps us in our weaknesses for we do not know what we should pray. We've already covered that. But he makes intercession for us according to the will of God. He's in us and works through us. He groans and shares in our pain. He takes, he takes over our need to communicate with our creator. When our weeping and whispers turn to silence, he takes over and groans to the Father on our behalf. So we must understand the power in speechless prayer. Understand the power in speechless prayer. Why do we need prayers without words? Because sometimes we don't know how to pray. You ever felt tired? And think, how many different ways can I pray this? How many different ways can I praise him? What new words can I come up with? The words start getting old. Come on, has anybody else been there? Maybe if we surrender, let him be able to bring forth what he wants to hear. Why do we need prayers without words? 
because we don't know how to pray. Sometimes, number two, you need more than a human prayer partner. I love human prayer partners. Thank God for people that pray for me and I can pray with them. And we have human prayer partners. Thank God for a wife you can pray with. But sometimes you need a non-human prayer partner. Sometimes you need a prayer partner that can engage you and do something, absolutely something about it through the power of his spirit. Amen? Thirdly, sometimes you don't want to pray. Can we get real honest here? There's times I don't want to pray. I'm tired. Thank God I got a, one truthful person here. Sometimes you don't want to pray. Most of you may be unwilling to admit that, but flesh gets weak. You get tired. You don't want to pray. Or you feel like it's some kind of work or duty and it's been pounded in your head. The Lord never intended for that. The Lord wants it to be more than a discipline. He wants it to be a time that you get with him and just talk to him. And that's what Paul meant when he said, pray without ceasing. Talk to him when you're driving up the road. Talk to him when you lay down. You know what I've told him, Lord, I don't feel like praying, but I know I should. Don't you know I love you? Can you look into my heart and know that I love you? Know that I want to please you? Even when I don't feel like it, help me with my lack of want to. Anybody prayed that? I have. It's getting honest with ourselves. There's a prayer partner that's available. And it's in these speeches, prayer sessions, that we must trust the Spirit's presence and partnership. If one is lacking for words, know that you're not alone. You are not alone. There's one that's ready to pick it up and pray through you. You don't even need to understand it. You don't have to understand it. All you might hear is some groaning coming out of you, and you might even recognize it's your voice, but it's the Spirit praying through you. Now, some of you are looking at, like, at me like I'm really weird. I want you to go to the Scripture for yourself and not just take what Pastor Kelvin says about this. Listen to Psalm 23, 1 through 4. And you need to know that somebody's always with you. It says, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in what? Green pastures. Leads me beside still waters. He restores my what? Soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley, the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for you are with me. I find it interesting. I, me, my, all through this thing. Why? Because it's personalized. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You're not alone. The enemy may make you feel alone. You may feel like you're carrying it all by yourself. You may not know what to do or where to turn. But thanks be unto God, his presence is always with us. I'm telling you, he's in this place right now, whether you feel him or not. He's with you, in you. He'll walk out the door in you and with you. He's always with us. Listen to Proverbs 18, 24. He said, there's a friend who sticks closer than a brother. Listen to John 14, 16, and 26. I will pray the Father and he'll give you another helper that he may abide with you part-time forever. But the helper, the Holy Spirit from the Father will send in my name. He will teach you all things and bring in remembrance things that he said to you. Listen to Matthew 28, 20. Teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. I love this last part. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. It doesn't matter who's president. It doesn't matter who's in Congress. It doesn't matter who's in Senate. It doesn't matter what country you're in. It doesn't matter where you're at. Lo, I am with you. I'll dog you. I'll follow you. I'll be in you. No matter where you go, I am there. Can we give him big praise for that? He's absolutely worthy of that. Amen. Amen. Dear LaMagna, you're not alone. Max Morris' family is not alone. Ms. McLaughlin, we're doing his funeral tomorrow, is not alone. The Jim Griffey family is not alone. We've got some people knocking on heaven's gates right now. They need to know they're not alone. There's a few of them watching on media. The Lord's able to heal. If he doesn't, they're still going to receive healing. I said they're going to receive the greatest healing ever known to mankind. So thirdly, how do we find victory and stability in those devastating moments? One needs completion. He says, for I consider the sufferings. Romans 8, verses 18, 21, 22. I consider the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that will be revealed in us. You have no idea. You don't get it. I don't get it. None of us get it. But his ultimate plan is the glory. The definition of glory is the total sum of God's attributes. 
So he's pressing those attributes, transitioning them in you and through you through hard times. This nation needs the glory of the Lord to show back up. What that means is we need the total sum of God's attributes working in this nation. Not just working inside the walls of church buildings, but working wherever we go. For wherever we go, we carry the church. We are the church. And we need the glory of the Lord to manifest in us. The glory of the Lord, the total sum of God's attributes. Who is God? He is Savior. He is healer. He is deliverer. He is miracle worker. He is peacemaker. He is reconciler. He is restorer. He, he is all of that. And we can keep on going and going and going and going in, in, in an almost an unending way of all those things that he is. In the name of Jesus, we just sang it this morning. He's all of that. He's all of that. And so he presses that out in us. He brings his attributes out. And when he does, the glory of the Lord is manifested through the sufferings. The total sum of God's attributes is pressing the glory of God out. The glory is not just some altar experience where you fall out and get goosebumps and and have some kind of spiritual experience. That's not what the glory of the Lord is all about. The glory of the Lord is you walk in the glory. You go to work in the glory. You negotiate in the glory. You find him as provider because his glory is manifesting in your life. The glory is not just an in-house thing. So when we pray for the glory of the Lord to come to this nation, we pray that God will make himself known as he manifests his attributes all over the world and in this country. Amen? Amen. Consider the glorious blessings. Consider the calling of God. Get a bigger mindset than just what you're going through. Let's get a bigger mindset, a picture of the big moment moving from sprint to marathon. In case you've not lived enough years, you're in a marathon, not a sprint. I used to think the world was coming to an end when I get in a sprint and lose it. But I found you keep on going. You keep on going. You get back up. I'm not meaning to bring attention to any particular candidate to influence your vote. But I have to say it didn't matter who got up after their shot in the ear. Got up. I like the fight. No matter what you think of policies, no matter what I think of policies, I like somebody to get back up and say, you know what? We got a job to do. Thank God it's not over. We've got a job to do. Somebody needs to get inspired that we got to get back up. We're not hanging down. We're not going to pots. The church isn't dead. The schools aren't dead. We're going to get back up by faith and keep moving by faith. (laughs) This quit thing needs to get out of our head. If you feel like quitting, get some people around you that can help lift your arms up. We're not going to quit. Better days are ahead. We may go through some suffering. We may go through some hard times. There may be some things we don't know about. We don't know how elections are going to go. I want to say, I do give a rip, but I want to say who gives a rip when I I look at the big picture. God is still in control of it all. This world is not going to hell in a handbasket until God says it's time. God's got this today. He's got us. He's got you. He's got all of us. Let's wrap it up with this. To find victory and stability in these devastating moments, one needs clarity. What shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who? Who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him for us all, how shall he not with him also freely Give us all things. Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died and furthermore is also risen, who is even now at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Some of you insecure people, you need to know that it's not that easy to get separated from the love of Christ. Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for your sake, we are killed all day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Yet in all things, we are made more than conquerors to him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor political parties, nor nations, nor individuals, nor principalities, nor powers. I put that in there, by the way. 
nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. So battle with perseverance. Battle with perseverance. Yes, you fight. You stand when you're supposed to stand. You don't turn tail. Turning tail doesn't need to be even in your thought processes. Hold on. Stand strong. Let's get it done. Through the power of the Spirit. He's willing to partner with you, pray through you, assist you, orchestrate events around you, provide favor for you. That's the work of the Spirit. The work of the Spirit is so much greater than just having a prayer language. The work of the Spirit wants to manifest Himself in your life to where He brings blessings and favor to your life. Can you give Him big praise for that today? He's, he's worthy of it. He's absolutely worthy of it. Battle with perseverance. Possess a bold perspective. That is what the Paul, Apostle Paul did when he declared all things work together. All things work together for the good of them that love God and are called according to his purpose. We as believers have a completely different perspective than this world. That's what the Apostle Paul meant in Philippians 4 verses 4 through 7 when he said, Rejoice in the Lord always. And again I say rejoice. Let your gentleness be known unto all men for the Lord is at hand. Be anxious for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication. Let your requests be made known to God and the God of peace which passes all understanding will guard your heart and your mind through Christ Jesus. That's what he meant in verse four, thir- four, chapter 4, verse 13, when he says, I can do all things through Christ whom strengthens me. That's what he meant in verse 19 when he said, but my God shall supply all of my needs according to his riches and glory through Christ Jesus. It's a different perspective because the Spirit dwells inside of us. If you're not sure he's there, invite him in. What are you doing? What are you trying to do business without him for? What are you trying to do life without him? What are you out here fighting on the front lines without him? He's there. If you call upon him, he'll be there. And in the most unexpected times, Brandon, when you lay your head down at night, he had no idea what he was going to speak of. When he said that, I thought, wow. When you lay that head down at night, Holy Spirit, I don't know what to pray. Submit yourself and see if he starts praying through you. It sounds so old-fashioned. I, 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 this, this, this kind of stuff takes me back into my childhood. The way we were taught, not every prayer, But if something urgent came up, I was raised among people that prayed. They weren't perfect, but they prayed. They knew who to go to. Once again, Brother Wendell, I see that Brother Wendell Smith. I've heard him pray. Heard him pray over our staff. Heard him pray in our staff meetings. I can name a lot of other people in this church. You know, what's going to happen when that generation leaves us? Who's going to pick up the prayer mantle? When we call a prayer meeting, it's usually a lot of, pardon me when I say this, a lot of gray hair shows up. Young people, somebody need to pick up that prayer mantle because you're going to have things you need to pray about. It's It's a beautiful thing. Let's not be afraid to pray, not ashamed to pray. So through the month of July, our governor threw out an initiative and churches all over the state are taking on prayer. What I'm advocating this morning is you say, well, I prayed, I I prayed the last few weeks, I prayed. Pray. (laughs) Let him pray through you. When you're driving on the road, let him pray through you. Am I weird? Don't answer that. That's not a weird thing. That's as much as in our DNA as anything I could talk about. Conclusion, could anyone, 
Could anyone lament or groan over, over people we have in captivity in Israel? Could anybody lament or groan over those people that are trapped? Don't know what's going to happen to their families? Could anyone lament or groan over the wars in Ukraine? Whoever you think is guilt or not guilt doesn't matter. People are being ravaged. Can anyone lament or groan over our national leadership situation? I mean, we don't even know. We're just a few months away from an election. We don't even know who, who's going to be on the tickets. Could, could anybody lament or groan over that? Could anyone lament or groan over fentanyl that's ravaging our community when your director of schools calls pastors together? She did last fall. There's tears in her eyes over the losses with kids. You say, ah, oh yeah. We got a bad deal going on in Bradley County. I'll, I'll go so far to say, and I'm not, <laughs> I'm just going to tell you, it's affected our church. Brother Russ Coffee, when we're sending people to other states and the judicial system is working with us because of drugs, does anybody lament over that? Is that or is that only the parents of the children's problem? Or is that only the... There must be a reason for that. Uh, I hope they learn their lesson. Let's see how that works as you apply the Good Samaritan story. Is anybody willing to lament or pray over the deception and lies, the constant lies? We don't even, even know who to believe in politics anymore. Deceptions and lies. Uh, when I grew up, at least people had some sort of trust. There was some sense of trustworthiness on some level, even by unbelievers. Today, people call themselves Christians and deceive as if it's all okay. Is anybody willing to lament over the next generation? What's being handed to them? Is anybody willing to groan over homelessness, poverty, mental disorders? I'll just say it as plain as I know how to say it or on unprecedented highs. Those things are on the rise and people stand around looking at each other wondering why. Is anyone willing to lament or groan? And here's the beautiful thing. You don't have to do the groaning. You just let, have to let the Spirit do it through you. You don't have to carry all this. You take it to the Lord and let Him begin to carry it for you. But the effort will be honored and the blessings will be good because he wants you communicating with him about some of this stuff. He allows us to suffer for the purpose of moving him toward him, not away from him. So let's grow. Let's lament. How, how, do, you, how do you possibly give an altar call and say, oh, let's come to the altar and groan? Who gets excited about that? What a spiritual experience that is. I'm calling on you to put on a mature, a mature understanding. And to do as we did a couple of weeks ago, and I heard last week we had tremendous prayer times, and I value those deeply. Nobody's shortcutting all their, all their services, but I will tell you this kind of message is taken out there. The real altar call is what are you doing in your car? What are you doing when you lay your head down at night? Like Brandon said, what are we doing when we're, when we're feeling, we're hearing the news and we get disturbed? Pray. Pray. Let's pray. Let's call on the name of the Lord. Psalm 116 said, they, I will incline my ear unto my people when they call on my name. Let's pray. This isn't a, again, to make anybody feel bad or guilty. It's to pick up a responsibility and say, I'm willing, I'm willing to give this a shot. Maybe try praying without words. Maybe try bringing a prayer partner into your life that uh, may call on you to just be available and he'll start praying through you.